All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's another week. Welcome back. Happy Monday. Uh, hopefully everybody's ready to work. We're kind of getting into the second part of our light and optics unit. So last class period, if you recall, we took a quiz on all of the things reflection, right? We looked at plane mirrors. We looked at curved mirrors. We looked at ray tracings with curved mirrors. We looked at the mathematics of curved mirrors. Those quizzes are graded. And so if you take a look at today's lesson plan, the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at those results. So for those of you that are in class, I'm going to go ahead and pass out the quizzes that you submitted. They're hard copies. I printed them out. So you're going to get a hard copy for you guys. For those of you that are on Zoom right now, I sent your graded quizzes to your school emails. So if you go ahead and check your school email, it should be there. If not, please let me know and something probably went wrong and I'll go ahead and try and fix that mistake. All right. So um, that is going to be the first 20 minutes or so of class. Then we are going to start jumping in to the second big optics property. We already looked at reflection. So when light waves hit something that is reflective, and then they bounce off of them due to the law of reflection. Now, we're going to take a look at what happens when light waves start passing through materials, and how do they change direction based on the material that they're passing through. So that is what is called refraction. So we have a couple of kind of other points that we're going to get into. What is the index of refraction? What is Snell's law? Snell's law is just a fancy word of, or a fancy way of saying the law of refraction. But guess what? Snell was the scientist that dealt with refraction. So guess what he was able to do? Name it after himself. Law of reflection. There wasn't really a scientist that like really uh, had claim to it. So we just call it the law of reflection. Snell's law is basically the law of refraction. What happens when light goes through a material, how does it change direction based on the refractive properties of the material? Now, I have a couple of demonstrations that we're going to do. So when we get into that, I'm bringing back our laser pointers. We have our red laser pointer and our green laser pointer. And I have a couple of clear objects. They're transparent. Transparent, just a fancy way of saying that light can pass through them. So we're going to go ahead and shine our laser through these two materials and see how they refract or how they change direction based on these two materials. One of them is plastic. One of them is glass. I have a third one. It's kind of hard to see, but it is a semi-circular piece of plastic, but it's filled up with water. Okay, so we basically have three objects that we're going to take a look at. Light traveling through these transparent materials we have water, plastic, and glass, okay? We're gonna go ahead and get those demonstrations and we're gonna take a look at maybe a sample problem or two. And then you have a homework assignment dealing with Snell's law, i.e. the law of refraction. That is not due until Friday, okay? That is not due until Friday because you have an e-learning day on Wednesday you will be given another activity on Wednesday. Since I'm talking about it, it's going to be a FET lab dealing with the bending of light, i.e. refraction, okay? This is a simulation that works on your iPads. It says HTML5 coded one. So you can go ahead and kind of click through the different ones. Basically, we're going to be shining a laser very much like what our demonstrations are going to be in class. And then we're going to take a look at what happens when it changes mediums. Okay. So we have an introduction. We also have a portion that is a prism. You can take a look at how does the light bend as it goes through that prism. You can go ahead and kind of have fun with that simulation, move around that prism, see what happens. We'll talk about the index of refraction, basically what happens when we change our objects from air to water to glass to some custom value. And so you can play around with that. There's also more tools 
for instance, you can come to this. You can add a protractor to the mix. Um, you can get a speed reading of your light wave. You can get an intensity meter for how bright your light is. You can kind of go ahead and play around with all these different aspects as you go ahead, turn on and off the laser. You can even change the color of the laser to see if that has any impacts. So that is going to be Wednesday. There is a lab that is going along with this simulation. You're gonna work your way through the lab. So basically by Friday, you have two things that are due. You have that Snell's Law packet, and then you're gonna work your way through this FET simulation with showing the bending of light as light changes from one medium to another medium. Sound good? Questions along our kind of agenda for the week. On Wednesday during the e-learning day, we will not have any required Zoom session or anything like that. Instead, if you have questions on either this FET simulation or on the Snell's Law packet, office hours, 12 to two, check in with me if you have any questions along the way. Now, I know I made the announcement as well on, well, what was that, Thursday of last week, but I still have not had anybody check in with me for test corrections from the unit one sound and waves exam. If you plan on doing that, you need to get that done before spring break. I'm not allowing test reassessments after spring break. Basically, I'm giving you this entire unit for you guys to set aside a time to check in with me, go over test corrections, and then if we need to do any uh, test reassessments on any of those four learning objectives that we had on sound and waves, make sure to get that done, okay? So we're getting closer to spring break. I wanna make sure that we get that in power school if you plan on retaking it. Remember, you're not required to, but you guys are big boys and girls, juniors and seniors. You guys should know that if you need to do better and increase your grade in power school, and if you wanna prove that you've learned that material better than what you had when you took that assessment, please make sure you schedule time with me, okay? I made that announcement on Thursday for when the BD group was in person. I wanted to make that announcement again while the AC group was in person. Is that clear? All right, let's go back to this idea that I'm now going to go ahead and pass out the quizzes. So folks at home, if you are on Zoom, make sure to check your email and start looking over those quizzes that were graded. And then we can go over any questions or I'll just get straight to the point. There were a couple of problems that a majority of us got wrong. So I wanna make sure that we clear up those misconceptions. Sound good?
All right. The first two problems are actually the most missed problems on the quiz. Okay. So what we need to realize is that on that first object, this is what the diagram should have looked like. I made the statement multiple times over the course of our reflection unit that the observer, which in this case is the eye down here, does not perceive light changing direction. We think that light just goes in a straight line. So if this is where the image is located, remember that for flat mirrors, the object of our distance is exactly equal to the image of our distance. It's just on the opposite side of the mirror. We have the real world and we have the virtual world. For this particular problem, we needed to go ahead and line up a straight line that went directly from the image to the observer, because the observer, remember, it's almost as if they're looking just directly straight into that virtual world. Now, at the point where that light ray was hitting the mirror, that is where we needed to draw in that dashed line. What is that dashed line called? Hint, what angle does it make with the mirror? 90 degree angle. So what is that line called if it makes a 90 degree angle? That's the normal line. And what we should remember is that the law of reflection states that theta i equals theta r, but both of those angles must be measured with respect to the normal line. So this right here is theta i because that is the light wave that was going into the mirror from the object. The object was sending out this light ray. It was getting to the mirror. And then when it got to the mirror, it was abiding by the law of reflection. And that is the light ray that ended up getting to the eye. However, the eye just thought that it was looking straight through the mirror in a straight line path. This is what our diagram should have looked like. We didn't necessarily need to have DO and DI or say that this is the normal line, but I wanted you guys to show that theta I was equal to theta R because the light wave came in at a particular angle, came out at that same angle relative to our normal line, which brings me to Problem number two, a lot of folks said that the angle of reflection was 20 degrees. That's not correct. Why isn't it correct? What's wrong with that statement? Hint, think back to problem number one. How do we measure angle of incidence an angle of reflection. What do we measure it with respect to? The normal line. Almost no one, almost no one drew in a normal line. We needed to say, if this is where the light hit, we need to draw in that normal line and that normal line makes a 90 degree angle. This 20 degree angle is not, is not, is not, is not the angle of incidence because you always measure your angle from the normal line to your incident light ray, which in this case is 90 degrees minus the 20 degrees. Well, what's 90 minus 20? It's 70. So if it was going in at 70 degrees, it was leaving at 70 degrees. It wasn't a trick question. It was me just making sure that you understood that when we're applying the law of reflection, these two angles are measured with respect to the normal line, not with respect to the mirror. This will be very, very important as we start to apply the law of refraction, i.e. Snell's law today. 
So we need to make sure that we can apply the law of reflection properly because measuring our angle from the normal line is very important as we move into the refraction portion. Uh, portion, portion. I was gonna say part and portion together. I said portion. That sounds really weird. Anyways, the part or portion dealing with refraction. Does that make sense? I would say like 90% of the class got points taken off on those two problems because they did not apply the law of reflection properly. Draw in your normal line at the mirror where your light rays are hitting the mirror. Then you measure your angles with respect to the normal line. Very important. Now, some people might say, well, okay, well, if this was 20 degrees, then isn't this 20 degrees too? The answer is yes. That's technically like not incorrect, but it's not the correct application of the law of reflection because it's going to become much more important as we start dealing with Snell's law. Always, always, always measure your angle from the normal line, not from the surface of the object, whether it's a mirror or in this case, as we start getting into our clear pieces of plastic and glass, we're not measuring it from the surface of the glass or plastic. We're measuring it from the normal line, which is perpendicular to the surface of the glass or plastic. We good with that? We're gonna make that mistake again? Good, that's what I like to see. No verbal cues, which is everybody no, Mr. D, we're not going to make that mistake again. I like it. Uh, moving on, mostly for three, we were pretty good. Specular reflection is just when it's going off a smooth surface like a mirror. Diffuse reflection is if it's going off a rough surface like the roadway. Remember how we talked about that example, right? So here is specular reflection, here is diffuse reflection. But the answer was some people did not answer. The second question, does diffuse reflection break the law of reflection? The answer is no. At every single location where those incident light rays were hitting the surface, the law of reflection was still being applied. But because those surfaces are very uneven, if we were to draw in normal lines at each one of those locations, the angles would be different for each reflective light ray, but the law of reflection is still holding true. For question four, all we really needed to show is that a beam of light coming in from the sun at this angle, if it would abide by the law of reflection, would come back and hit the person. However, if we drew a beam of light coming from the sun at 1 p.m., it would hit the window and then maybe hit somewhere here. Is this beam of light going to be observed by the person? The answer is no. That's why you wouldn't see the sun's reflection in the window at midday, but when it's about to set, at seven o'clock or if like we're late in the summer here in indiana it's awesome it stays light until what like nine o'clock like in june and july it's fantastic you go out to play golf and do like twilight golf like you can get in like more than 18 holes because it just stays light the entire time not that i've done that or anything you know any questions on the front page no we good moving on Now, some people had some issues with the ray diagrams. I will say that this was an open note quiz, correct? Did we have all of our ray diagrams at our disposal? Yes, we did. Use your resources if you're allowed to have them, okay? So we should have our first light ray from our object. One thing that I saw is that there were some people that didn't even start your light rays at the object. That's your like number one starting point. Literally, this is where you start all of your light rays. Start it at the object. Why? Because the object is the thing that is giving off those light rays. So we had one that went in parallel and then it went out through the focal point and kept going. Some people forgot to put in the dash line. The dash line exists for the reflected light ray. Some people were putting in the dash lines for the incident light ray. There's a difference between incident, the one going into the mirror versus the reflected one, the one coming out of the mirror. So this one, because our intersection took place there, we had a real image for this one. This one, you could have also just looked at the notes 
If your object is ever inside of the focal point, this is when we get a virtual upright image. This is where our light rays should intersect. This one was a convex mirror. Convex mirrors always produce virtual images 100% of the time, no ifs, ands, or buts. And our image is always gonna be between the mirror and our focal point. Each one of them, remember, we had two principal light rays. We had our parallel ray and we had our focal ray. For this one, instead of using my focal ray, I decided to use my third principal light ray, which is called the radial ray. This is the one that goes through the center of curvature. From the center of curvature, the mirror is just the radius of our circular mirror. And so that ray just kept on going back into the virtual. But for most of them, the other two, I used parallel and focal ray. For my convex mirror, I used my parallel and focal ray as well. Next. Probably the biggest mistake that we saw on question number eight. I italicized it, guys. Shouldn't that have been a hint? Why do you think I put it in italics when I said that the image was five centimeters behind the mirror. What does that mean? Where is it located? In the real world or in the virtual world? It's in the virtual world, which is why that five needed to be negative. So if we did the math, if we do one-tenth plus a negative one-fifth, that's actually one-tenth minus two-tenths, which gets me negative one-tenth. Now, there were a couple of people out there that did not realize that negative one-tenth was equal to one over F. So what do I need to do? I need to flip. However, when I flip it, I need to flip both sides. So that is why my focal length should have been negative 10 centimeters. It's negative 10 because this was a convex mirror and the focal length, if we had our object, it said that it was spherical in nature and our focal length was inside of that spherical reflecting orb and that means that it was a convex reflecting surface. So my focal length was in the virtual world. Are you okay with that? Now, if we got to part B, does the image appear to be bigger or smaller than the bird itself? You could have drawn a ray tracing for that, or you could have done the magnification factor. Five divided by 10 gets me one half. Since my magnification factor is less than one, we have a smaller image. Last but not least, we had question nine and 10. Most people got this one correct. The only difference is that we need, we, if we got to this particular point and said that one over DI was equal to negative 0 0.027 repeating, that's not my answer. I need to take the inverse of this. The inverse of negative 0 0.027 is one over negative 0.027. And if we go ahead and plug that into our calculator, we should get an image distance of negative 36. Now for part B, is the image he sees real or virtual? You could explain using math or ray tracings. I said it's virtual because DI is negative. Whenever we have a negative value, it's a virtual image. Yeah, Morris. Do you want to run Which one? Well, I use repeating. And so when I went to my calculator, like since I just used the answer that was repeating, it got me exactly 36. Okay. But if you did round it to 0 0.027, then you would have gotten something a little bit bigger than that, I think. Like, but I don't think I marked off for it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Did you get one out of one? Yeah. yeah. Then you're good. All right. I'm, I'm, I wasn't too worried about the rounding. I was more worried about the work leading up to it. Okay. Yeah. If you got anything around 36, or sorry, negative 36, then you're good. Yep. Last but not least, um, we had a pair of sunglasses. They were also convex. So we have a negative focal length. So if we did our math, we should get an image distance of negative 13.33. Remember when doing the magnification factor, we didn't really worry if it was positive or negative. We were just looking for the amounts, the numbers and we should have gotten a value that was one third as much. So the image was three times smaller or one third as big as our other one. Most of the time, most of the students, most of you guys 
did pretty well on the math and the ray tracings overall. It was actually the very beginning of the quiz that we struggle with. But as you guys just shook your heads to me, are we going to make the same mistakes with the normal lines ever again? No. How do we measure our angle of incidence and angle of reflection? What do we measure it with respect to? The normal line. Ah, perfect. So we measure it with respect to the mirror, right? No. With respect to the normal line, not with respect to the mirror, which is why that 20 degrees right there was not the answer. 70 degrees was. We good with that? Any questions? Now, remember, with your quizzes, because there are no um, reassessments on the quizzes, because A, it's open note, and B, I grade it still at that 80% cutoff. So you might have noticed, be like, wait a minute, how did I get the grade that is in power school? So basically, instead of 10 points being the threshold, eight points was the threshold. So if you got an eight out of 10, that's technically an eight out of eight because I just brought it down to like the 80% mastery threshold. So then an eight out of an eight is 100%, which is an A, which on our four point grading scale is a four. So basically take your point total. If you got a seven out of 10, well, no, with the new grading scale, because 80% is mastery, do a seven out of eight. If you do a seven out of eight, I believe that gets you like an 87%, 87.5%, which would be a B plus. And in power school, the B plus is at 3.33, right? We're on the GPA grading scale. Does that make sense? Are there any questions on the grades that popped up? You guys that are in class can keep those quizzes. They're yours to study, okay? You might see some of those problems, not the exact same problems, but something similar on the unit two assessment that we will take right before spring break. So hint, hint, wink, wink. A lot of these questions that you saw on this quiz, if you did them on the quiz correctly, you should be able to recreate that and do it again on the unit two assessment. You'll see things like law of reflection, ray diagrams with plane mirrors. You will see again, ray tracings just like these. And once again, you will see the mathematics of mirrors once again. So it's another opportunity to prove that you've learned the reflection property. And hopefully you can get a really good grade on that portion of the test. Sound good, Morris? You're going to crush that portion of the test? We're going to crush the refraction portion of the test now too? There you go. That's the spirit, 100%. All right. Go ahead and go back to uh, Canvas page. All right, so a couple of things. I have posted for you a refraction PowerPoint, okay? It is titled Refraction and Snell's Law. We're going to work through this PowerPoint, but I want us to go ahead and take notes, okay? So I'm actually going to do this on my document camera and just take notes based on the PowerPoint. Now, we're gonna be focusing today on refraction. So we're not gonna complete this entire PowerPoint because when we come back on Friday, we're gonna be talking about these two topics, critical angle and total internal reflection, all right? But so if you scroll through this PowerPoint, we're going to talk about the speed of light and what uh, refraction is. We'll talk about the index of refraction. We'll talk about this idea of reflection and refraction. I'm going to bring up an analogy for just a second on how we understand what's going on. We'll then talk about this idea of Snell's law. And then any slides after Snell's law, do not worry about. We'll actually look at those slides on Friday when we discuss critical angle and total internal reflection. So we'll talk about the critical angle as well as this idea of total internal reflection, okay? And basically some uses of total internal reflection. But 
This PowerPoint is available to you. We're gonna go ahead and go through our document camera notes, and then we'll go through our demonstrations using our piece of plastic, our piece of glass, and then our water, just to see how that uh, refraction takes place. So the notes are available to you as a secondary resource, but we're gonna go ahead and create our own notes to make sure that we're on the same page, all right? All right, so a couple of things. We've actually already talked about the speed of light, but I just wanna have this as a refresher, all right? The speed of light, the variable that we use for the speed of light, it's a very specific velocity. So instead of using V, we use C. Well, C is super fast. It is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second squared. This is in scientific notations. Basically what this means is that it is the number three with eight zeros after it. So if you were to write it out longhand, it would be three with eight zeros after it, which would equate to 300 million meters per second. That's super fast. Now, there's a stipulation with this though. This is the speed when light is traveling in a vacuum. What does that mean? What does it mean if speed is tra if our light wave is traveling in a vacuum? If we were, someone were to define that, maybe in layman's terms, what's a vacuum? And I'm not talking about a vacuum cleaner. I'm not saying that this is the speed of light when it is traveling through your dirt devil. There you go, space. Basically the absence of everything, okay? So basically in a vacuum just means that there is no medium through which it is traveling through. And a perfect example of that would be outer space. So as the light is traveling from the sun to the earth, it is traveling through the vacuum of space and it is traveling at 300 million meters per second which seems super fast, but guess what? Our solar system is super big. And even our solar system is pretty darn tiny in comparison to the galaxy that our solar system resides in, the Milky Way galaxy. Milky Way galaxy is so big, and yet there are billions of galaxies that make up the universe. We are so inconsequential compared to the size of the universe. Don't go home and be like, Mr. D said that we were inconsequential and your life had no meaning. No, I'm just saying that we are super, 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 super small in comparison to the vast expanse of the universe. Now, the crazy thing about that, I even said that, okay, our solar system is small in comparison to our galaxy and our galaxy is small in comparison to the universe. The speed of light is super fast, but it's all relative. The time that it takes for light to go from the sun to the earth, the time is roughly eight minutes. And that's with light traveling at the speed of light, 300 million meters per second. So here's kind of a weird thought that goes through your mind. If the sun were to explode right now, when would we see that explosion? Eight minutes from now. What? So by the time we see it explode, it's already exploded. Yeah, Morris. Like, it's 
Yep. Yep. Everything that we see that the sun is doing happened eight minutes prior. So when we say like here on earth, like your local weatherman's like, oh, the sun's going to set at 9.08 tonight. Nope. The sun set at nine o'clock. It's just that the sun, the light that it emitted at nine o'clock did not get to the earth until 9.08. Here's something that's even more of just something that messes with your mind. Everything that you see is in the past. Even though light is traveling so darn fast, even the reflection that you see in the mirror, right? We just finished up our reflection portion of our light and optics unit. The light, light comes from the ceiling, it hits you, and then it reflects off of you, right? Even your body is abiding by the law of reflection. That light goes from your body to the mirror. And then the light that hits the mirror, what does it do? It comes back and hits you in your eyeballs. But it still takes time for that light to travel. Even though it's going super fast, it seems like it happens in an instant, right? Like when I turn off this light, you guys see it instantly, right? Well, instantly is a relative term because the light that you're seeing is traveling at this speed. So technically, when you see your reflection in a mirror, you are seeing a version of your former self by like nanoseconds because it's happening so fast, but the light travels to the mirror and then back to your eyeball. So everything you see happened in the past. That's crazy to think about. Like you wave at yourself in the mirror and you're waving at your former self. You're waving goodbye to your former self. Like, I'm only looking towards the future. So far, so good. Questions with the speed of light? Cop. Well, this then jumps into our idea of refraction. By definition, refraction works not only for light waves, but it also works for other types of waves. What did we start uh, study during unit one of second semester? What waves were we talking about unit one? Sound waves. So this idea of refraction, it works for all waves. We're gonna talk about it specifically in terms of light waves, but it technically works for any type of wave. Basically, the definition of refraction is when a wave changes speeds because it travels through a new medium. One other thing with refraction is that as this wave changes speeds, because it's moving from one medium to another medium, the wet wave, the wave may also change direction based on the angle it enters the new medium. Those are like the two big ideas that help us with refraction. Refraction is when their wave speed changes because the mediums that it's traveling through are different. Okay. And Based on the angle that it's entering the new medium, we might get a change in direction of that light wave. So far, so good? The next thing that we need to talk about is the index 
of refraction. Another word for this, a synonym, it's called the optical density. It's basically saying how dense your transparent material is. So as your light wave is traveling through this material, the speed at which it slows down by is going to be dependent on your optical density. Now, how do we solve for the index of refraction? Your index of refraction, the variable that we use for it is the letter N. It is equal to the speed of your light wave in a vacuum divided by the speed of the light in your medium. Remember, your value of C is just the speed of light in a vacuum, which is always what? What's our value for C, the speed of light in a vacuum, such as outer space? Good, 300 million meters per second, right? Three times 10 to the eighth power meters per second. Good. In your equation here, this velocity V is your light speed in whatever medium that you are traveling through. Now, let me get a little bit more specific. This value of N represents your index of refraction for the medium through which your light wave is traveling through. Just wanna, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint really quickly because your PowerPoint has a really nice table for various indices of refraction. So in your PowerPoint, as it talks about the index of refraction, the index of refraction of a substance, of a medium, is simply the ratio. So that's the ratio that we see here of the speed of light in a vacuum compared to the speed of light in that particular substance, in that medium. So in a vacuum, your index of refraction is equal to one which makes sense because if you have a value of one, that means that your speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in a vacuum just gets you a value of one. Notice your index of refraction in air. It's 1.00029. So right now, these light waves that are traveling in the room through air, what's, what's the speed of light for those, more or less? If our index of refraction is so close to one, we can basically say that the speed of light traveling through air is pretty much the speed of light traveling in a vacuum. There's no discernible difference. However, if you have light travel through water, it has an index of refraction of 1.33. Ethanol, 1.36, glass, 1.5 depends on the type of glass and how the glass was made, but on average, it's about 1.5. Diamond, 2.42. Diamond is a very dense material. If you think back to like chemistry, like how is diamond made? Well, diamond is just carbon, right? But it's carbon that has been crushed together over millions of years. So diamond is very optically dense. And because the more dense the object is, the more the light slows down. So you should note that in this table, the larger your index of refraction, the slower your light wave becomes. Notice that your index of refraction and your speed of light in the medium, is it a direct relationship or an inverse relationship? What do we see based on our index of refraction equation? 
how does your velocity, the speed of light in a medium compare to your index of refraction? Is it a direct relationship where both variables go up or both go down? Or is it an inverse relationship as one goes up, the other one goes down? Well, where's that V located? In the numerator or denominator? Denominator, that means it's an inverse relationship. That's our big light going off. So as our index of refraction goes up, the speed of light in that particular medium goes down, okay? So there's an inverse relationship. So the higher the index of refraction, the more optically dense the object is. And if something is more dense, it's harder to move through it, which is why our light waves slow down. So far, so good. Now, let's go back to our notes. So what I want to do is actually, let's just get into our demonstration, okay? So what I'm going to have is, I'm going to put my piece of plastic here. I'm going to go ahead and draw a nice little outline. Okay. And what I'm going to do is using my green laser, I'm going to go ahead and shine a green laser through this particular object. Oh, that's the translucent side. Let's go right there. Okay. Awesome. You guys see that? Here's what I'm going to do. With my pen, I am going to make a couple of points. I'm going to make a point. Oop, make sure there it is. Make a point right here. Point right there. Point right there. And a point right there. So what I'm going to do now is actually using a ruler. I had my laser beam shine in from my laser right there. All of a sudden, it was going from air into plastic. You guys okay with this? Well, I know that the index of refraction for air is about one. Technically from our table, it said that it was 1.00029, but we're just gonna go ahead and round that and say that our index of refraction for air was one. So we're going from air, which is in this case, less dense, to plastic, which is more dense. You guys all right with that? Now, one thing that's interesting is that when I had that piece of plastic there, there were actually two light rays. Did you guys notice that? That if I go ahead and shine this laser again, so I'm starting off with one laser beam, there it is. What is this light ray right here? That's the reflected light ray. So there's actually two properties happening when the laser beam is getting to this boundary. We are having an incident light ray come on in. So this one right here is our incident light ray. But then 
we're getting, based on the surface, we are getting a reflected light ray right there. Hmm. Well, here's one thing that I want to check. Lucky for me, I have a nice little protractor right here. When was the last time you guys used protractors? What was that? Elementary school. Well, congratulations. Hopefully we haven't forgotten how to use protractors. What I'm going to do is let's first test to see if the law of reflection is holding true. You guys with me on that? Well, in order to test the law of reflection, because you just told me about 10 to 15 minutes ago that you would never, ever, 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 ever make this mistake again, what do we need to draw so we could figure out if our law of reflection is being abided by or not? I have to draw in the normal line. So we have the surface of our plastic. Now our plastic is technically doing two things. It is reflecting the light ray, but then there's also an additional light ray that decided to go down through the glass. That one right there is our refracted light ray. But we need to go ahead and draw in a normal line. So in order to do that, I'm gonna line up my protractor with the surface. And now I'm gonna make sure that we draw a line that is 90 degrees. Ah, there it is. There is my normal line. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to line up my protractor. So this line is on the surface of my plastic. Here is my normal line. This angle is theta i, and this angle is theta r. Well, let's see. This line right here appears to be going to about the, if we were to continue it, that looks to be about 56 degrees. wait a minute, we're measuring it from our 90 degree mark. So what is theta i? What is that angle measurement right there using our protractor? Because we're measuring it from our normal line, which is at our 90 degree mark. And then we're, looks like we're at about the 56 degree mark. So how much is that angle right there? 34, right? You just did what, 90 minus? 56, so we have a 34 degree angle, perfect. Let's double check the other side. It appears as if here is our 90, this one is at about the 57 degree mark. Now remember I drew this kind of freehand, but does it appear that we went from 90 to 57? Does it appear that they're both about the same angle? I like that. This one is what, like 33 degrees? It's 33 and 34 degrees, pretty darn good considering this is a hand-drawn. Ah, so the law of reflection works. However, what I need to do is I need to take a look at what's happening to my refracted light ray. I'm gonna take that normal line that I drew in and I'm going to continue that normal line down into my piece of plastic. Here's one thing that I want you guys to take a look at and compare. Just looking at it, how does my incident light ray, and notice that I'm going to measure this angle from my normal line, how do these two angles compare? It looks smaller. Ah, so right now, our angle of incidence is greater than our angle. In this case, we are calling it the angle of refraction. 
because this angle right here is the angle relative to my normal line of where my refracted light ray is. Hmm, they're not the same. Well, here's one question for you. We went from air to plastic. We went from something that was less dense to something that was more dense. What happened to the speed of the light wave when it was my incident light ray compared to the speed of my refracted light ray? It slowed down. Wait a minute, not only did it slow down, but it appeared to have changed direction, right? Our entire definition of refraction is that the wave speed changes because it travels through a new medium. In this case, we were going from air to plastic. That always happens when you change your mediums. The speed changes. However, based on the angle at which it enters the medium, your wave may change direction. Now, we're gonna come up with two big key concepts. The first one, and we're gonna come back to this page in just a second, but, We are going to call it the marching band analogy. Anybody in here in marching band? Used to be. Used to be. Ashton used to be. Connor, who's asleep. Oh, are you in the marching band? Perfect. Then this analogy is for you. Okay. So let's imagine that we are magnifying this. We're going from air into plastic, and we had a light ray that came in to our medium at an angle. And that angle, once again, we need to go ahead and draw a normal line. So we could go ahead and measure that angle of incidence. However, Connor, you're gonna be my expert on this because I did marching band in high school too, but I forgot everything that I know about marching band. It's just completely out, out of my brain. Like, I don't know how to mark time. Like, I don't know any of that stuff. Like, it's gone. Okay. Now, when you're in a marching band, you're usually like, let's say you're in a parade. Okay. There's usually what, like four or five people across in row, right? So let's imagine that we have this marching band, and yet this is the midpoint. This incident light ray is the midpoint. And all of a sudden we have one, two, three, we have four people in a row in this marching band and they're all marching forward, hopefully in step, hopefully at the same speed, because that's what makes a good marching band, right? Like that would be a very terrible parade if everybody's just marching at their own beat, everybody's marching at their own speed. I wouldn't want to watch that parade. I would leave like, oh, no. Not a good band. So let's say that we have the best band, the best band in the whole land, Marching Millers, and they're marching in step. They're marching with the same speed. All of a sudden, we're going from air, which is less dense, to this plastic, which is more dense. Let's bring it back to the marching band analogy. Let's say that your drum leader, your, um, they, they took you down the wrong path for some reason. Let's say that the air is the street, which is usually where parades are. I would hope so, right? It's usually where they host parades, our homecoming parade. It's fantastic, right? March to downtown Noblesville and march right back. But let's say we were led astray. And all of a sudden, they went through the cemetery. Oops. And let's say that this was after a very rainy day. Actually, let's not even say that it's a cemetery. Let's say that it's the pond. They somehow got led astray, and they're now on the football pond, right? That huge retention pond that after it rains, that's where all the water 
for the foreseeable neighborhoods, all that water gets dumped out into the pond, right? At the south end of school. So now that would be like going into the plastic where you have like all this water. And if there's all this water, the pond gets super muddy. Is it easy to march through standing water and mud? No, that'd be really hard, right? So what would happen to the speed at which you're marching? You slow down tremendously. That's the same thing that's happening to our light ray. If we're going from air, where we're in a less dense optical medium, and we're going into a more dense optical medium. It's like going from the street, which is super easy to walk on, versus trying to walk through water and mud and slush and just all that filth that the pond becomes when after a hard rain. Okay. Now, if we're going back to this marching band analogy, there are four people in a row. Out of these four people, which one hits this boundary first? How about I number them for you? Let's number them one, two, three, and four. Which person in that row hits the boundary first based on our diagram? One. So basically when one gets to this boundary, the other three marchers are still on the street. So what happens to marcher one when they reach the boundary? They slow down. But one, two, three, and four are still traveling at the same speed. So one's going slower, then all of a sudden it too will finally get to the boundary. But one has kind of slowed down by the time that two gets to that boundary. Three is still going fast and four is still going fast. So what happens is that as each one of these marchers gets to the boundary, they slow down because they're in a more dense material. So what happens is that they actually change their direction based on when those marchers actually get to that boundary condition. And so what we noticed from that previous slide, and Ashton, I think you were the one to kind of make this observation, when we went from a less dense material to a more dense material, the angle at which we went to our boundary was greater than the angle at which they were now traveling in the new medium, okay? So it's almost as if we could call this theta one and we could call this one theta two. When you go from a less dense to a more dense material, the angle one or the angle before you get to the boundary is going to be greater than theta two. Yeah, Ashton. Mm-hmm. Ah, like it's like you turn a corner, right? So like if you're turning a corner, the person on the near corner, they have to like kind of slow down and like wait as everybody pivots around them. That's exactly what's happening. You're turning a corner, right? It's not like you're a pinwheel and that person basically like stays stationary. The person on the far end, they're walking really fast, right? To turn that corner. Oh, wait, some of that marching band stuff's coming back. Thank you guys for that. I was usually in the middle because I was a terrible marcher. They wanted to hide my awfulness. I'm well aware that I sucked. It's no good. Connor, you're laughing. Yeah, I was terrible. I was. Okay. Not good at it. Yeah. Right. It was new. To, it was new to you. Yeah. They're like, well, we don't know what to do. You didn't tell us. Got it. So this idea is that if you are going from a less dense material to a more dense material, your angle becomes smaller. And it becomes smaller relative to your normal line. You always, always, always measure your angles 
relative to that normal line. Okay. Now, what happens if you go from a more dense to a less dense? What do you think would happen then? You'd speed up and instead we would see the opposite case. As you speed up, your second angle is actually larger. The demonstration that I want to show for you guys on that one, let me get a new piece of paper. That's 145, all right. I'm going to bring in the semicircle of water, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and make a nice, Tracing of this, hopefully, there we go. Now I'm gonna do the same thing. I am going to try and point my laser at the midpoint. I put a little dot there, okay? So this is the center. I'm gonna go ahead and shine my laser through the water, but I'm going to try and hit the point right here at the center. There it is. So I'm going to put a dot right here. That is where it is entering the water. I'm going to put that dot right there. And then there's one final one. That is where my light ray is. I'm going to move the water. And I'm going to go ahead and connect the dots to see, to trace out the path at which this light beam took. So it looks like we went in that direction. Technically, this was going the exact same, but then all of a sudden, we got to this boundary right here, and it looks like we turned a corner. Now, I want to see what happens. This is my beam of light. This is my incident light ray. So we are traveling through water. Water from our table has an index of refraction of 1.33. That is an experimentally determined quantity. For water, it tells us the optical density of water. It's 1.33. When it gets to this boundary condition, we're going from water into air, and air has an index of refraction of about 1. Right, it's 1.00029, which eh, it's one. Now, the last thing that I need to do at that boundary condition, I'm going to go back to my protractor. And I'm going to go ahead and draw in a normal line. Nice and dashed normal line. This right here we can call theta one because it is the angle before we reach this threshold of our boundary condition. And this angle, we can call theta two. Notice that we were going from water, which was a more dense medium, and our light wave was now going into air, which is a less dense medium if we strictly compare our indices of refraction. And what we notice, just based on our drawing, do we see that theta one is less than theta two? Okay, and the whole reason for that, Ashton, you mentioned it, if we're going from water to air, what happens to my speed of light? It speeds up. So we have that marching band analogy. And if we had that marching band, as it was taking place, as they were marching their way towards the boundary, this marcher reaches that boundary first, correct? And if they reach that boundary first, they're the ones that are going to speed up. And because they speed up, that is what causes that change in direction to occur, right? They sped up, so all of a sudden the angle popped as we kind of turned that corner. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, how do these two angles relate to one another? That is the last thing we need to talk about. This is what is called Snell's law. It states 
that the index of refraction for the first medium, in this case, we're treating our first medium as the water because this was our boundary right here, right? So water, we're calling this object one, air was object two because this was our boundary condition right here. So in terms of Snell's law, you're gonna have the index of refraction of our first medium times the sine of thing, uh, angle one, theta one. So in that particular case, that is angle one, that is the angle of our incident light ray relative to that dash normal line that we drew in. Remember, the normal line just makes a right angle, right? Our normal line makes a right angle with our boundary condition. So then we're gonna set that equal to the index of refraction of our second medium. In this particular situation, our second medium is air multiplied by the trig function sine of our second angle. That is what Snell's law, which technically is a fancy name for the law of refraction. Let's double check it. I just want to go ahead and do this. Let's measure this angle really quick. 90, dang, I'm getting really good at this in terms of drawing it. On my meter or on my protractor, I went from 90. It looks like we went to 56 again. So Morris, that means that theta one is a 34 degree angle, according to our protractor. What I want us to do, one of the last things we're gonna do, we're getting close to being out of time. I want us to solve for theta two. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and solve for theta two using Snell's law. So in this problem, let's see, N1, we're gonna have 1.33 times the sine of 34 degrees is equal to N2, well, this refracted, bent, changing direction light ray is now in air, and air has an index of refraction of one. Okay. Now, a couple of things. Make sure, please, 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 that your calculators are in degree mode because we measured our angle in terms of degrees. For those of you that are in like pre-calculus right now, you might be doing like unit circle stuff and you're doing it in terms of radians, but double check your calculator, make sure that we're in degree mode. All right, so it looks like we have 1.33 times the sine of 34 is equal to one times the sine of angle two. Well, one, we can just kind of get rid of, right? But now we have the sine of angle two is equal to this stuff. How do we get rid of that sine function? How do we undo this sine function so we're just left with theta two? Ah, do you do the inverse sine? So if we do the inverse sine on this side, we're just going to have theta two, but now we need to do the inverse sine of all of this stuff. If we go ahead and get our calculator, let's see, we're going to have the inverse sine of 1.33 times the sine of 34 degrees. And if I go ahead and I'm gonna double check, oh, I'm in radian mode, good thing I checked, otherwise that would have given me some weird numbers. Gotta make sure degree mode is highlighted, perfect. And now let's go ahead and hit enter. And it looks like solving for theta two, gave me an angle measurement of roughly 48 degrees. Any questions with that one? Now, I just wanna use my protractor. Let's go ahead and measure it. Let's double check. 
So if I go ahead and put my protractor on that line right there, here is my 90. It looks like we went to about, does it look like we're at about 40? Making sure, yep. Take a look at where this incident light ray hits. Does it hit at about 40 right there? Which means if it hits 40, what's the difference between 90 and 40 giving me this angle measurement? Is that about 50? Okay, so we're getting a measurement of about 50 degrees. How does 50 degrees compare to what we calculated it to be? Does it look like it's about the same? 48 and 50s, yeah, the same thing. Remember, I drew this by hand. So that's why I'm okay with it being, yeah, we got 50 degrees. That's pretty darn close to the calculated value of 48. Any questions with Snell's law? You guys are good? We happy? It's Monday. We're getting closer to spring break. More people are getting vaccinated. That's a good thing. Like everything's looking up. I actually get my vaccine today. First shot. Got to get the second one over spring break. Hopefully I don't have too much of an adverse re uh, reaction to it. That would stink. All right. So the next time I see you guys is Friday. You have two assignments that are due by Friday. The first one is the Snell's Law packet. It is four pages. Um, one thing that I want to draw your attention to, let me go ahead and share my screen with both folks in class as well as on Zoom. If you click on Snell's Law Packet, here are your instructions. Please complete the following four-page packet on refraction and Snell's Law. Hey, those are the two things that we talked about today. Makes sense that that's our assignment. Now, one thing that I will say is that do your best with the angle measurements. Usually in the past, like I've used this packet for years and years and years. I think it's a great resource. However, in the past, I used to give out paper copies of the packet. And we used to do this packet in person where you'd be able to use a protractor, just like I use the protractor right here on my sample problem. Okay. Now, do your best with the angle measurements. I'm okay if you like kind of make it up as long as it's reasonable. If it's a small angle, make sure that it's like 10, 20, 30 degrees. If it's a large angle, make sure you're maybe like 60, 70, 80, whatever it might be. As long as you are comfortable with those angles that you're using, then you can calculate your and do your math from those angles. Because I know that you do not have a protractor. You're doing it on notability. Do it to the best of your abilities. Yeah, Morris. For your test, you would probably be in person. If you're in person, I'll give you your protractor. If you're at home, um, once again, you're going to be given these instructions. Do your best. And I, I will understand wholeheartedly that you're doing your absolute best. And as long as you show your work and you're just like, oh, like here's my angle of incidence and I'm just going to call it 30 degrees. And then if you're doing a Snell's law calculation, just like we did here, right? As long as you have that first angle and you're trying to solve for the second angle, as long as you tell me what that first angle is and you do the math right, you'll be good, okay? I, I know that this is an interesting situation that usually everybody would be taking their test in person and everyone would have a protractor and you could go ahead and measure those angles just like I did using this guy, okay? But because we're in a weird year, I will be very lenient. Just, just show your work to the best of your abilities and then everything will be a-okay. Yep, good question. So there's your packet. As I mentioned before, your e-learning day is March 10th. So that's why your due date for it is March 12th. I haven't posted the FET simulation yet. I was making final edits for it, but that will probably be posted at some point today. So if any point you wanna start working on the FET lab, that is your e-learning day activity. It'll just be due on uh, Friday as well. Sound good? All right. Well done today. Good activity. I'm glad that we were able to wake Connor up with the thoughts of marching band. That just sprung him right back to life and he was good to go. In the moment we mentioned turning a corner, he's like, oh yeah, definitely turning a corner. Got it. And for those of you that don't know what's going on, that's fine. Inside marching band stuff that all of a sudden 
pop back into my brain. I quit after junior year. I couldn't do it senior year. They expect they expected me to like play varsity soccer and then literally like go march at a football game on the same day. I was like, get out of here. I'm done. I can't do this. Gotcha. I think I'm done. Yeah. For me, we got to march in the uh, Orange Bowl parade my sophomore year. And once I got to do that, I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of fizzling out of marching band. I think marching in the uh, Orange Bowl parade was the highlight. 